Despite her achievements, Connie Francis' name seems to be often overlooked nowadays when it comes to the history of music in the US. So who was she and why do you need to know her name? Born Concetta Rosa Maria Franconero in 1937 in an Italian-American family, as early as the age of four, her father pushed her to appear in pageants and talent contests. She had a younger brother, George, but their dad focused more on his daughter to make up for his own failure of becoming an entertainer. The singer would later describe her family as from a Norman Rockwell painting, but with a father who had a stereotypical Italian-American overprotective attitude towards her. The area in which her family lived was controlled by the mob, and she often overheard conversations she shouldn't have to, to say the least. She learned how to play the accordion at her father's insistence, but she hated the instrument. She later commented that her dad chose the accordion because it's quote-unquote probably the least sexual musical instrument. During her teen years, she appeared on NBC's Star Time Kids and CBS's Arthur Gottfried's Talent Scouts. It was Gottfried who asked Connie to drop the accordion from her act and change her stage name to Francis from Franconero as it was easier for him to pronounce. She was glad to let go of the accordion, but was afraid of her father's reaction to the name change, so she asked Godfrey to use her real name until she could convince her father it was a good idea. Connie got hired as a singer for demo records and soon signed a contract with MGM for her own singing career. Unfortunately, Connie was only signed because she had recorded a song called Freddy. This was the name of the son of an MGM co-executive who thought that it would make a nice birthday gift for him. Freddy was released as a single, but with no interest from the record label, it failed to chart. Between 1955 and 1957, she released 10 singles, but neither one found success on the charts and the label was ready to let her go. Connie herself was ready to give up and accept a fellowship at the New York University. She was soon told that she'll have to give up that dream too, so her brother could go to college instead. Connie declared, quote unquote, in an Italian household, the son always comes first. In October 1957, Connie and her father entered the MGM studios for one final try. She recorded several songs and her father insisted that she do a cover of a 1923 song, Who's Sorry Now? Connie flat out refused, thinking it was ridiculous to sell a 35 year old song to teens. But her father believed that if modernized, the song would appeal to adults who know the song, but also to the new generation. Two months had passed and, just like with her previous releases, the song went nowhere. Connie returned to her home to spend the winter holidays with her family. On January 1st, 1958, without prior announcement, Dick Clark played Who's Sorry Now on TV and an American Bandstand. The TV show had an audience of close to 20 million at the time, when the US population was of 172 million. The single went quickly to the top of the charts in the UK and South Africa, and at number 4 in the Billboard Hot 100 and R&B chart. Four years after signing with MGM Records, Connie finally had her hit. But her next two singles failed to get the desired success, so Connie was back at square one. She met with Neil Sedaka and Howard Greenfield, which played her songs that Connie found too intellectual and sophisticated for her audience. They finally played her a song they found silly, Stupid Cupid. The song would become her second UK number one and reach number 14 in the US. Connie would establish herself as a rock and roll singer as proven by Stupid Cupid and another US and UK top 5, Lipstick on Your Color. The latter also became her first Australian top 10. But George Sr., Connie's father, was already playing ahead and realized Connie couldn't have a long-term career just by releasing rock and roll hits for teens. Despite Connie not wanting to, she was convinced by her father to release an album of new and traditional Italian songs in order to appeal to the adult contemporary radios in the Italian community in the US. The album, titled Connie Francis Sings Italian Favorites, was a success. It spent 81 weeks on the Billboard chart and picked at number 4. It was her first album to chart and it remains her most popular release. But it was in 1960 that Connie would make history. 
seeing the potential of appealing to different nationalities and ethnicities, in 1960 alone, Connie recorded albums of favorites in Spanish, Yiddish, and another one in Italian, which became her second most popular LP. In those days, the language barrier for American artists often stopped them from being famous internationally. A song would be recorded in English by one artist, covered by another artist for the German market, another for the French market, and so on. Connie decided to make her own songs famous by herself, recording in different languages for different markets, like how European artists such as the Lida were doing. Her first experiment was Everybody's Somebody's Fool, which would become a huge hit. Connie Francis became the first female artist to have a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, two years after the chart's inception. It also peaked at number two on the R&B chart and 24 on the country chart. It became her 70 UK top five in three years, reached number one in Australia, New Zealand and Norway. The English version peaked at number 26 on the German charts, but the German version reached number one. Kanye became the sixth American and first American female artist to top the German chart. She also became popular in Romania, France and Italy, having back-to-back -back number one hits in the latter with Jealous of You and Where the Boys Are. The song Where the Boys Are was the theme song for Kanye's first motion picture of the same name. The movie was a success and it helped popularize for Lauderdale as the go-to spot for the spring vacation. Connie didn't want to do the film and, for once, her father agreed, due to content he found obscene. But while her career was taking off, her personal life took a huge blow. Connie met up-and-coming singer and songwriter Bobby Daring as early as 1956. The two would soon fall in love, but Connie's father didn't approve and did his best to stop them. The two singers even tried to elope, but were stopped by Connie's father. The relationship ended after Connie's father threatened Bobby with a gun. As Bobby had a heart condition, Connie knew such distress could be fatal and never tried to reconcile with him again. Indeed, Bobby would die about a decade later, age 37, due to his heart problem. Connie would only see him years after they broke up when someone called her to his hotel room saying he was depressed. Connie arrived, only to find him with two prostitutes. They never found out who pranked them. Connie named Bobby the love of her life, even if she would go and get married four times. By 1961, Connie sold over 15 million records. After another number one US hit, Don't Break the Heart That Loves You, in 1962, Connie's career started to decline. The reason was the British invasion, led by the Beatles, Rolling Stones and the Kings among others, which made American rock and roll artists, including Elvis, suffer from low sales. Women in American music were particularly impacted, as the British invasion was mostly led by male rock groups. After 1964, Connie would never have a US Top 40 ever again, while her last charting single on the Hot 100 came in 1969. By then, Connie also gave up on her film career, as she never felt comfortable making them. She continued to remain popular in continental Europe, even in the Eastern Bloc, but in 1969 she left MGM, tired of working continuously since the late 50s. During the early 1970s, she would make occasional appearances on TV shows or festivals like Cherbul Dower, but she was generally living in semi-retirement. She planned a comeback, yet those releases failed to gain attention, but she started touring again. In November 1974, after a concert in New York, a stranger broke into her room at the motel she was staying and raped her, then tried to suffocate Connie with a heavy mattress. While asking for money, Connie explained who she was and gave him her belongings. The man left and was never caught by the police. Following the rape incident, it was her father who came to pick her up. Instead of comforting her, he insinuated she was damaged goods and said she's lucky that her then husband is a liberal. Connie sued the motel chain for failing to provide sufficient security and won $2.5 million. The lawsuit also led to a reform in hotel security. Nevertheless, Connie developed depression and for a long period of time stopped leaving her house. She managed to get through it with the help of her friends. In 1977, Connie underwent nasal surgery, but something went wrong and she lost her singing voice for the next few years. 
1981, the year in which she was able to start singing again, her brother was killed by the mob as he turned FBI informant. She continued working on her comeback and even had two songs reaching the lower position of the country and adult contemporary charts. Unfortunately, Connie's father sensed that something was up and had her committed to a psychiatric hospital where she was diagnosed with manic depression and started the treatment for it, including shock treatments. In 1984, she attempted to end her life and was in a coma for several days. In total, during the 1980s, she was involuntarily committed to mental institution 17 times in 9 years. She was also treated with lithium, which made her lethargic. Later, Connie found out that she had been misdiagnosed. After years of suffering, she actually had PTSD. With her life now again on the right track, she began recording new songs and holding concerts. In 1992, a medley of some of her biggest German hits reached number 2 in both Germany and Austria, ending the year in the top 10 best-selling singles in both countries. Since then, she's made occasional TV appearances and performed in concert from San Francisco to Manila, but retired from performing in the late 2010s as the quality of her voice declined due to old age. Connie's father passed away in 2005. Regarding him, she said, quote unquote, he was a highly combustible Italian father, but I adored him. He had a tremendous influence on my career. She also added, quote unquote, I can never forgive him for controlling my life, but I have to admit he was the architect of my brilliant career and for that I love him. So what has made Connie so iconic and why is she important in music's history? Connie Francis wasn't the first female rock and roll singer and she certainly didn't invent it, but she put her own twist to it. While several female rock and roll singers came and left, Connie managed to build a career in this genre. As she herself explained, Quote unquote. Rock and roll is a masculine kind of music, with its mindset of come on out baby we're going to rock, best suited for a man to sing. The mistake that many girl singers have made is trying to compete with a man, whereas I've tried for the cute angle in lyrics. Indeed, this type of girlish rock and roll approach has helped her establish a career and became the first female artist to have a number one on the Billboard Hot 100. By expanding her repertoire to novelty songs, torch ballads, country, she was one of only six female artists to score more than one number one hit single during the 1960s in the US. Her decision to record her songs in several languages is also noteworthy, as at the time American artists weren't really doing that. As a result, some people consider Connie Francis to be the first American female singer to become an international star. But despite her achievements, Connie Francis isn't part of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plenty of articles and blog posts are published every year talking about this baffling omission and the fact that she wasn't even ever nominated for it, despite the fact that she's been eligible to be inducted ever since the Hall of Fame was established in 1983. Of course, you must also remember Connie's courage of openly talking about her sexual abuse and for getting involved in various projects which aim to help women who have been in a similar situation. To end this video, I leave you with some words by Connie herself when asked if she has any regrets. Quote unquote, My whole stick in life is a regret. I wasted a lot of time and emotion on things that were not important. If I could tell the young singers of today, Gwen Stefani, Selena Gomez, Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera one thing. It would be to remember that yesterday is a cancelled check, tomorrow is a promissory note and today is cash. Life moves forward so quickly, make the most of it while you can. I don't plan to waste another day. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and a comment and don't forget to subscribe for similar content. Thank you, take care.